ladies, no one's coming out, the, going into the front, uh, the, not the front, cabbage show, or a woman saying, oh, he's cut it, isn't it lovely? And at the airports, they come up and say, oh, it's, you've cut it, it's much nicer, and all that. They with me, it made up. me anonymous for a change. That's kind of nice. I mean, my sense, I mean, just anonymous in, in straight you neighborhoods mean, and places like that. I don't you mean that I'm lonely. You still look like a freak to me. Mm, yeah, you definitely. Yeah, I mean, mustache and you're still sticking out. People there now treat me like a normal person. There's nothing you can do about it. You don't. Do <laughs> you think you look straight in your movie? Forget it. <laughs> Is that what it is? And he thinks he's gone straight. He wanted to look straight for the movie. I told you, must have told you that. In Austria, you know. and they never saw us in Austria. None of the Austrian press ever saw us, except for one radio guy that called us the next morning. And the whole interview in the bag, and they were t it was on TV, and they're just all interviewing this bag. I just love that really idea. Asking, because I put myself there? in that situation, I'd be forced to do it also. There I'd be. I'd say, well, maybe it really is them in there, and then yeah, it shows the complete. <laughs> We just did it in London, we did a really? talk show there, and every time the guy wanted to talk about Beatles, which he only did once, I made him go in a black bag. It was like the Dick <laughs> Cavett in London. So every time he spoke and he had the bag on, all the crowd, you know, they, they, the cameras would go to him, and there'd just be this bag and all the crowd would crack up so we could never get anything said about the Beatles. It was great. It was a good show. Well, set, okay, set I'm getting a little bit of a buzz. As if they were fluorescent or something, but I can't see where it might be. Oh, it must be. <laughs> All right. Are so we, what are we going to do? Are you going to talk yeah. uh, first? Okay. Well, I want to know what, what's going on. All this activity and everything. This is the mo uh, Yeah, I think this is the most activity I've seen in the place where you're actually staying, ever. Yeah, well, we have a schedule, you know. And uh, so we have to finish it. Right, but uh, we don't want to go. Yes, I know, because right. of the... Right. But anyway, so the thing is, I, I have a feeling that when you started off like that, that uh, that's how you started off with the uh, interview we had last year, too. You know, like you were saying, well, this is the, you know... The, the craziest most scene I've ever seen. <laughs> right, you know. <laughs> anyway, we were so, pretty busy in Toronto. It's pretty routine, though, right? you know. Right. Oh, right. I remember the signing of right, the right. So, right. It's always the same. And uh, when we met you December, <laughs> right, last year, that was a pretty... Well, busy we're really time preparing too. for Yoko Syracuse Museum show on October the 9th, probably opening then through October 12th onwards for three or four weeks. Probably yes. that's what we were really preparing for, having artwork shipped over from England, etc., etc. Things Syracuse, like that. Syracuse, New York. You know, the Everson Museum. It's a beautiful, beautiful. place, and she's mm. going to have a, a retrospective show there that shows the last 15 or 10 years' work and work she's done of late, and I'll have one corner to herself. We'll be showing guest movies there. Guest artist Yeah, guest artist. Yeah, right. <laughs> guest artist. Isn't that sweet? And then we're going to show movies there and have, you know, it'll be great, and you're invited and, to uh, that. Yes, and, of course, course. music yeah. and... Uh, Films. film and all your work for, right. that has ever been made so that's what we're really on at the moment uh, we're just about finishing off the film we're making for uh f to to go with the two albums we just made and uh, we're just finishing that off yes and, and uh, then we start on the show the syracuse thing what kind of films what are they to... for uh, well it's for tv you know uh we just made a sort of surreal come type movie that goes over the top of the whole, so, mo probably every track on the Imagine album and three or four tracks off the Uncle's Fly album out now, right? And we've been make we were shooting just as we were recording, but we're not using it, we're not making it like a documentary, it's all sort of like an Imagine, like the albums, you know, and uh, mm. it's just very nice, we've been filming that for months and we're just finishing You're it becoming very, now. very surrealistic at this yes. point, isn't yeah, it? it's beautiful. And then and we also... just hope it's TV footage, mm. you know, well, I think it is. Mm. And then we'd send it around the world, you know, and, and uh, uh, hope for the best. Grapefruit, you know, my book, <laughs> that's coming out again in paperback form. Uh, except this time, I think, because I think it's just boring to just, you know, publish it as it was. So this time, there's about 20 pieces added to it. They're not new pieces, I just dug it out of, you know, my closet or whatever. Okay. And they're going to be added I didn't know to, that, that you yeah. to it. Hmm. 
and that's yeah. going to be October 1st, I think. Because a lot was missed out the first one. Mm. See, what, last time when it came out in the hardback, people think we're crazy and going out putting it out again. But I couldn't get to, we, I couldn't, <coughs> we, we couldn't get to America to do any kind of plug on it or even mention it when it was coming out in America. And we were in America when it came out in Britain. Mm. So last time in Britain, although we're, uh, it's only a small country, so you don't sell a lot of anything, really. But uh, she only sold like 5,000 because there was nothing said about it, just sneaked out. This time we did two, like, publicity stuff, i.e. signing sessions at a shop somewhere. And that was it, wasn't it? Mm, but that And uh, it sold 15,000 in the first couple of weeks. Mm. And we wouldn't bother pushing it, except for in, the, in grapefruit, there is 10 years of her life. And it'd be silly to pass it over, you know, by just because we couldn't be around to plug it. So they're willing to do it paperback, which they normally do with books anyway. Mm. It sold about 50,000 here in hardback. But this is a big country. There's plenty of And also, people. I really believe in And we both I'm believe saying, in the you know. book, you know. And so, uh, uh, there's been some great response in England about the book this time, from especially from the underground, you know. And there was a pretty good article in it in England, IT, with her. And there was some good, we just read the letters that the kid, a lot of kids from like Yorkshire and places like that sent. And it turns out some beautiful like poet type guys and uh, women out there, you know, that, that, uh, that there's some, some beautiful stuff came from you know? Yorkshire, you know, and, and so it's a strange like place that don't even have an underground paper hardly, you know. And uh, some beautiful letters came about that that people have got in, into grapefruit from the last time or from this time. And also, so we really think it's worth pushing it, you mm. know, because it's a real turn on. It certainly cleared my head out, you know. It, it, to me, it was just like, uh, like reading I Ching for the first time or getting into any other thing. Once I started getting it, it, it really is a turn on. You know? And you know this thing that I'm always saying, everybody's an artist and it's just that they were <clears throat> taught by their foolish parents or something, you know, teacher or something that, well, that you're not an artist, you're not talented, you know, or something like that. And so they believe that they're not artists. And this really is true because, uh, so grapefruit, all the instructions are so easy. And then suddenly all these letters I'm getting, they say, well, I was so inspired, I wrote some instructions, you know, and they're sort of, what was talking about the all these guy, beautiful instructions, sense. you know, and it shows that just anybody can do it, really. And some of them are going to go out in places like Bradford, you know, these are really old industrial towns in Britain, where it's, it's really like those old British movies, you know, like nowhere. Mm. And these guys are going to start doing these things in the street, and a couple of them have got a hall together to perform great through things on stage. It's fantastic. And all we did was two, two cell things, you know, just go to a place and just like all the other authors do and sign you know and a few hundred people come to the shop and from that you can sell the book and from that that happened it was just great and uh because first time it just went out and you know and i sank. think you've read that thing but you know the water event mm -hmm. you see this show the museum show is going to have all sorts of different shows that i did before and it's like retrospective in a way but and uh, one of the shows called a water event and i'm asking all my friends now you know to participate in it and in a way you see like it's a water sculpture show and uh, the water sculpture consists of water and the container and the, the container part i'm asking my friends to sort of think of the idea or send me the container that they think is right for the sculpture and I'm sort of uh, putting in the uh, water part, you know? Mm. So the water sculpture, half of it is water, half of it is container and it's called uh, Yoko no plus so-and-so, we'll be sending it, you know? Yeah. Or and, Howard uh, Johnson's for that matter. Right, <laughs> and so it's going to be like that, and that, that is one of the ten shows that will be there in the museum, I think. Be, so it's quite exciting for me. I've never done a show, you know, except in a place that a gal gallery just just about to fold or something. It's, you know, it's a funny thing. It usually happened like that. Agnes Gallery, where I did my first uh, do-it-yourself uh, exhibition in 1961. It was about a month before it, fo it folded. 
and the uh, Indica Gallery show, which I did in London. Um, the gallery at that banished. time, I didn't know, you know, the gallery, yes, banished. Right, and we went to a Japanese restaurant a too, and that so was burnt after. down the next day. Right, so I don't know, what, you know what's happening with me. But anyway, it seems so like all the out. galleries uh, who give me shows seem to fold right after I have a show there, you know, whatever. So, well, don't frighten the museum. No, no, I shouldn't f frighten <laughs> Jim Harthus. I'm afraid to put this on the air. Don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> no, no. We might no, burn no, down. <laughs> oh, no, no, don't go into no, that. No, no, I'm kidding. Yes. I'm kidding. But anyway, well, I got scared. And then, uh, so that did you have any year. time to uh, go into my album, you know, have you? Yeah, listened? I listened to it. I just had time to go through it once, you know, listen to every cut. One Shall time. I interview you? Shall I ask you <laughs> questions about it? No, I want to ask you some questions oh, about it. Okay. okay. Uh, you wrote everything on it? Yes, yes. Music and... The... Lyrics. lyrics. And lyrics, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, of course, the way I make things, you know, is uh, this uh, Joe Jones and Tone Deaf company, for instance, you know? Uh, it's a kind of, he made eight new instruments for me, especially for this album. And they are sort of instruments that, you know, are sort of different from the usual instruments, you know. So I thought that those new instruments would express new feelings, you know, emotions or whatever. And, uh, you know, you don't have to do anything, you just push a button and it just starts to move and it goes on moving, you know. Yeah. It's that kind of thing. Like robot musicians. Yeah. And uh, yeah, stuff beautiful. From yeah. years ago. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and also the jam type thing, I usually say, well, look, uh, let's do some quiet number, shall we? You know, that kind of thing. And we just take it from there on, you know. That's the way I play things. And then later, I would either edit it or not edit it, you know, cut it, you know. And uh, the ones like Mrs. Lennon, of course, I have to, you know, it's it's like a song, Just a regular song, song right you know, now. chords and tell them what chords they yeah, are, etc. Yeah, like you know. So like with the tune thing she does, it's just like me or anybody recording. She come in, teach us the chords, we learn it, and then she sing it. With the uh, the like, don't worry. Uh, the, in Midsummer New York, that's the same. That was a rock number, so we just did like a rock backing. Mine train. Then she just said, I want to do a train number. And it's about this and that, and uh, so play. Yes, right. And it just went so on like you know. If it's going well, we come up with a good track, which on Mind Train, it's just beautiful rock going it's on. It's a kind she's of going reciprocation, you know. Yeah. I go dub dub, and they you know go like that, and it just goes on, you know, like affecting each other. And Jim Keltner, you should mention yeah, his drumming, it's just fantastic. out of this world, you know. You um, know that. We've been working, I, mean, yeah. I have worked with him on my album, and other times we've both worked with him. But on this mind train and the, the, the drumming on it is just fantastic. Mm -hmm. And the bass playing from Klaus. And, and the that, guitar. Yeah. And guitar. all the instruments, is mm -hmm. very nice, yeah. You know, and a young boy a... from a record shop. Right. Uh, he brought us a guitar that I was buying from a guitar shop, and it, he just sort of could play it, you know, so he's on Yoko's album playing Chris somebody. I think and what we're going to do too. is Mrs. Lennon and uh, Midsummer New York would be a single probably. And then, you know, we're thinking of Mind Train, but Mind Train... Later. Though. Later, maybe, you make know. Make a sort of... We could make... Did you set out to make a double album like this? No. You know? No, first I thought, well, this has to be a single <laughs> album you know and then it just got to the point that i just couldn't you know shorten it really there was no way of doing it so i just this all right double album. it was a big move really because i thought well if it's a double album i don't have no chance you know like i mean if it is a single album people can endure it even if it's so you know freaky or whatever but if it's double freaky you know what is gonna you know so i, I thought well that's very very bad for me but i just had to you know well the thing is uh, she she wanted to do the things with joe jones and i especially wanted to do that as well and then of course she wanted to rock and roll you know because huh? she's been getting into it each time it's becoming funkier and funkier rock and she really wanted to do uh, rock a straight rock number and then she wanted to then she said but i want to do a ballad too i've got these <laughs> she's got about 
20 or 30 of those songs, beautiful songs, which we never have More of them taken the... Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, because before when I came in, you were, asked me, you know, yeah. which one I liked the best, yeah. and I was kind of embarrassed because yeah. I liked the most lyric one on the album, and I uh. thought that that would annoy no. both no. of you because we almost flattered. never do that. But said. she did remember I Love did on the that. B-side of who Give Peace a Chance, wind. Who Has Seen the Wind on the B-side of Instant Karma. They're both straight ballads. They weren't recorded as well. Re uh, remember Love is a beautiful tune, but we did it in a after Give Peace a Chance in the so Toronto hurry. bedroom yeah. with sort of, you know, a bit hurried with portable equipment it's always just rolling, and you know. who has seen the wind their voices all cracked and we we just left it and the musicians weren't together and we mm. it, it was Wonder what everybody's song. reactions it's the first time saying. we've done a decent ballad you know we've mm. given her a decent backing for a ballad that's why the others were sort of overlooked a bit but she's got many more of those songs but she wants to do it all you see like rock ballads and the very sort of far out stuff and uh, it, had to be it, it just built album, like that yeah. so it, it works out all right because one album is like rock and ballads almost and the other album is like goes, it goes further and further out from the first number onwards really virtually you know yeah so i don't think you know it would for <laughs> some people it would still be boring or something i don't know but i think it, as a whole there's a sort of a message you know it's a power to it i think you know well, a lot of the criticism that you've gotten with your albums, with your songs, you know, from the times I played them and asked people to phone in their comments mm, and things like that. You were very courageous. You were the first one to <laughs> pick it up, I, I remember. And well, what, what everybody, what, what all their feelings were, where they all said, that's not singing, that's not music. And in my defense of what you were doing, I kept saying, it's not meant to be rock yeah. and roll. It's yeah. not meant to be folk singing. It's meant to be, it's, it's an art form. It's a different kind of thing. And everybody said, yeah, but you this is a rock station why are you playing it and, you know and, and, and so plus all the normal rock. things yeah. about how tell her to go someplace because she oh. broke up the Beatles oh yeah you know right. all of that well now can she stuff. have the credit I keep saying this everywhere I go but give her the credit for the good album that George made and the stuff that Paul made and the stuff that Ringo made and the stuff that I've made since she supposedly broke us up if she did break us up give her the credit for all them great albums that came out you know? <laughs> there's been far more Beatles product than ever before and if you're really that keen on the Beatles all you have to do is take a tape of each album or make your own Beatle album out of it you know if you really need it that bad to hear one of us singing next after the other you know and I think you know that the John's <coughs> album the first one you know uh, John Lennon Plastic Ono Band with a uh, working class hero and all that, you know. It was like a peak and I just thought, well, it's going to be hard for John to write something better than that. And imagine I really think that is better than, you know, the last album. I don't know why that happened, it just happened. And this time, for me too, it was sort of difficult for me to do something better than the last one because I thought, you know, I sort of put everything into it in a way, you know. I thought, well, it's going to take about a year at least for me to sort of, you know, get together again, you know. <clears throat> but, but you think that if somehow, it's time, must... yeah. But somehow, I think this is better, don't you? Yeah. Sure. But well, what I had started to say though is, is after having said to everybody. Yeah. thinking that I understood what you were up to yeah. saying well you see it's not rock and no. roll and it's it's not pop music no. that isn't what it's about and then no. here's the song Mrs. Lennon which is a ballad yeah but don't worry yeah. Kyoko was a was a rock song. and roll to me I mean yeah. you know I'm a, a an avid rock and roll fan and that's the music I like best you know still and don't worry Kyoko which is on the album as well but it was on the back of cold turkey I think it's definitely rock and roll, and Remember Love is definitely a ballad. It's just people's conception of what Yoko was that made them couldn't hear what she was saying or singing. Do you but feel when that's, that's going go, away somewhere? It is fading away like a mist, you know, and people are beginning to just hear. If you play the last album, why the first cut on the first side is, is, a, is a fantastic rocker, in the, I think personally, in the class of... Uh, uh, Tutti Frutti, you know. It's the same kind of thing. It has the same effect on me as when I first heard Tutti Frutti. When I first heard Heartbreak Hotel, it sounded like Mind Train does to me now. I could hardly make out what was being said or heard. All that, You know, we'd never heard sort of American voices singing like that. They'd always sung like Sinatra or enunciated very well. Suddenly there's this sort of hillbilly hiccup in, in, on tape echo 
you know, and all this bluesy background going on. And we didn't know what the, what the hell Presley was singing about in the early days, or Little Richard. We couldn't make out what they were saying, or Chuck Berry. It took us a long time to work out what was going on. To us, it just sounded like a noise that was great, you know. And uh, the Yoko's just skipped out all the word bit on a lot of the stuff and just gone straight, just does wop bop a luma right through the song, you know. Do you think that it's a, at a point one of your songs, not one of the ballad ones, one of the other kind, could actually make it to the top of the chart, you know, get a bullet and billboard, you know, that whole kind of number? Do you think... It would be nice, you know, it if could, that happened. I know it would be yeah. nice, for you, yeah. but I mean, do you think it would be... I reckon, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if in a uh, couple of years, I don't know how, how few or how many, that uh, pop music could be that far out. But there's still James Brown and those people. James Don't Brown gets pretty, in pretty near a, into a, playing a loop you know, on some of his records, mm -hmm. part one and part two. Mm -hmm. It's not that far away. If you listen to Midsummer New York, uh, Mind Train, it's not that far away, especially Mind Train. We were thinking of uh, doing, if Mrs. <coughs> Lennon and Midsummer New York do reasonably well, say getting the top 50, 40 even, then we might make a part one and part two of Mind Train, you know, like What Did I Say or one of James Brown's or whatever. I think that I think the music and the singing uh, is up to it, you know, I think it is very, very good. And uh, it's what just a matter of what the it? audience no, could like take, it. you know. If well, Mind Train, the best if the other two those. made it first, mm. if one of them made it, then there'd be some relaxation and then they might be able to hear Mind Train because it's really something. I think it would be more daring to put out the single of Mrs. Lennon and Mind Train but it's probably safer commercially to do Midsummer New York and Mrs. Lennon. Yeah I think if, because you haven't had a single before and because of the, the, the way the market is I think it'd be safer to put the two recognizable song mm -hmm. forms out first and then break them in and then try and get Mind Train in on the back of that if it if, it, if we're lucky and if it goes well, that's how it would be. Otherwise, it, it still would help sell the album, I think, to hear those things on the air as well. Mm. Oh, singles do promote albums, so they tell me. <laughs> no, everybody always says that, that the single yeah, is just an so, ad for the album. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> what they say, so. But this isn't, because uh, a lot of people that wouldn't buy the album might enjoy hearing the, those two songs, you see, that wouldn't want to go through Joe Jones and the, the heavier stuff which I like, I love the airmail and you, there's two tracks for them. Oh, I want to on, ask, do you want to hear something about uh, the recording, how we did the recording on the Joe Jones stuff, because yeah. it's quite interesting. Mm. One, the first time what we did, there was eight instruments, or maybe there was more sets of his things, you know, some of them were like music stands with like violins hanging down, things. nobody and, plays yeah, them and they tinkle percent. on their own, or there's drums that play by themselves, and They're bells that ring, stuff, you know. so you can imagine a, a, a small studio full of them, like a, a mini philharmonic robot like orchestra, there, well know? they can't see it on the radio, that's what I'm describing yeah. it, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we laid one track of each instrument on its own, each robot instrument of eight, eight tracks of each separately recorded, right? Eight separate instruments on eight separate tracks. Then Yoko sang with each individual track eight times again, so there's eight voices. This is on one called You. So you have the instruments and eight Yokos all singing at once. It's fantastic, the voice thing. You have them all over in stereo. If we're stereo played like that, it's just out of this world, you know, the voices are all over, eight women's voices, all different pitches. Another thing we did was, uh, Joe and I just sat at the controls and just brought the instruments in gradually and then Yoko just sort of freelanced over the top of them. And they were improvising we too, were improvising, improvising with that instrument, together. you know what I mean? And that, that was called like airmail, you know? that, that's called airmail, and that, uh, although it's the same lineup, you know, the same band and the same singer, say, the sound, although similar, is just completely different, because of course there's eight voices, and, and the band is all jamming, it's beautiful. And I write them all in sort of traditional forms, like uh, uh, the Mrs. Lennon and Midsummer New York, they were written traditionally on those, you know, sort of scores, you know, so-called mm. scores, that you can, you know, music scores, and uh, the other ones, the Joe Jones, tone deaf type, was 
done in the uh, sort of classic avant-garde fashion, shall we say, you know, sort of instructions kind of thing. And so um, there is a sort of, uh, you know, point of departure, you know, not, it's not like they just departed, you know, it starts from after departure, but, you know, there's a certain point that you can sort of uh, You mean it's not associate. Jackson Pollock, it's more like Magritte. Right, exactly, yeah. that's what I'm trying mm. to say, you know. I know, I could hear you struggling. Yes. <laughs> Let's go on to the next one. <laughs> ding dong, ding dong, next yes. round. Okay. Yeah. I, I want to ask you something uh, away from the album for a yes, minute. Yes. But I, I said the same thing last time, and, and it goes again this time. Uh, you seem less paranoid again last time I had said that that you seem less tense less paranoid than the time before that yeah do you feel that way because you both seem to almost have eliminated it completely I don't know well, if it's no, just no, the day that I hit you on or what but it seems like you both I mean, I'm looking mainly yeah. at your eyes and everything, yes. and it's prime, and, and it doesn't look like you're. Well, I don't mean just it. nervous with yeah, me. I, know, I, I don't mean that at all. I mean, sure, well, it's getting that. better, like the song says. And, Especially uh, uh, between us, it's getting better. We were saying the other day, you know, it's very unusual. I don't know if it's unusual. No, it's very strange for us that we never expected it. So it's strange for us, but. Uh, last year was very tough, wasn't it, Joe? Mm -hmm. And this year, somehow, it's almost like a reaction. You know to last year but somehow it's getting so good you know between us somehow sort of like um there's another level that we didn't know you know that we're going into because you i know. think it's apparent you yeah, know because i haven't nice seen you now in months and yeah right so it probably well. is true you know i mean of course we had the uh a few years ago we were at the beginning of the relationship and also uh we're having all that attention and uh, you know was wh whatever was going you know, on thing, but, but also the, the relationship time, tension, and, right. and the relationship tension with the public was a bit strange there was the beetle thing going on and the Klein thing and the apple thing everything was going on at once so i reckon we were under a lot of pressure the last two years you know mm. uh, so that would account for it a bit so we are more relaxed yeah and we're working and that's the best thing mm. instead of being with lawyers you know mm, exactly i mean you know we're, we're making really records and films mm. and uh i don't think people who have ever been involved in heavy legal things really realize how debilitating that is oh i mean it's it is scary. just it's awful i mean lawyers refuse to speak in uh, in any other language but sort of lawyerese so even when they're talking they talk like those things they write you know and even you say yeah i know that i know that but they will insist on saying the whole damn sentence or they get uptight so then it takes four hours with a lawyer to say what you could say in 15 minutes with a normal human being, you know. Mm. Can so you talk it goes about on the, and on and on like that. Can you talk about the law, the case Except with the child at all? No, no. You see, I mean, that's one very uh, sort of, um, you know, sad thing actually that we have between us, which is, you know, this thing about Kyoko and all that. And, but I mean, we share it in a way, and and John has always constantly encouraged me about it. So I mean, we, we be became closer because of this problem too, you know. But you know, I don't want to go into that really. But I mean, you know, if we can get your it would be nice. But I mean, uh, does a decision do imminently or? Uh, we don't know, you know. It's all just we like we know. have to go to court and all that jazz. That's and the heavy side all, of our life. All we can now. say is that she just wants to be able to see her at least as much as Tony sees it, and that's all yeah. we can say. We can't say anything about the legal bit, mm. and that's all we're asking. We're not saying that, you know, we want her totally, and we're not allowing her to, you know, sort of continue her relationship with her father, whatever, you know. And that's the point that probably most people don't realize. But I think that's pretty fair, you know. Mm. But um, other than that, you see, um, I think John and I are very concerned about the political situation of the world and all that, and we feel responsible as, you know, for another citizen or whatever of the world, you know, to do something about it, and we're always trying to do it. But, you know, when you came to see us when we were in Toronto, you know, well, that's the time that we were very busy involved in that, that side of life. And now we're more involved in our sort of artwork, you know, of course, I mean, artwork is always connected with 
you know, I mean, we feel that this is our social statement and this is the way we communicate with people. So I don't think there's any separation between this and our political things we did and everything. But still, it seems like this fits better, you know, like we, you know, it, you know, we feel better doing our artwork, you know, like somehow it's agreeable, isn't it, John? Sure, I mean, that's mm. what we are, isn't it? You know, so this is where we are, you know. So sort of it's like we found what we are in a way, you know, when we're just working very hard together and being together seems to be the sort of best agreeable thing for us to do. You know. Yes. No, it's so still, it's still a, 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 a strange uh, kind of relationship in a certain kind of way about this closeness thing, which most people don't seem to be heading towards at all. I I sort of sunny and Cher. <laughs> <laughs> They can do it, I suppose. Okay. The, um, yeah, this thing about being close together. I asked yeah. you this a long time ago. I don't remember in which yeah. interview we did or what. But the thing about, can there be such a thing as being too close? Can that actually, close. because in your case, it doesn't seem that like way. Like stifling seems, each no. other. Then. Well, you see, we're both mind people, you know. Yeah. So uh, to be apart, we don't have to physically be apart, you know. Mm. Uh, exactly. I, that that you have to say that. I just it? said it. <laughs> oh, I mean, all right. <laughs> I thought. I just the said. Tape it. Ding dong, ding dong. Oh. <laughs> but it's true, you know. Uh, <laughs> She's and not the thing here, is, is uh, okay. Well, you know, I know your cynical statement. You always bring that, but what, I mean, that's what, the what? attitude, general attitude, Howard, what? of people. You know, yeah, I think I'm say, reflecting. Well, it's oh, oh, I see. You know, yeah. right. But the point is, uh, this is a sort of you know interesting. Well, they're all brought up to think that. That a couple, you mustn't give a child too much love. Couple mustn't be together too much. Uh, husband, it's muscles. good for the husband to be working in America while the wife's in Brazil. Yeah. You know, we don't believe all that jazz. That's just mm. some social Christian jazz that somebody must have laid on us a few generations ago. And you can't give a child too much love. Mm. And if you love somebody, you can't be with them enough. No. There's no such thing. We don't want to be apart. And uh, after There's and no through the Janov thing, we yeah. found out mm. because uh, literally the Janov thing turned out to be a test for whether we could live apart or not. Mm. So we went through that. We can live apart. Part of Janov's thing was to separate us for a night or a day or a few hours or whatever it was oh, at I various times, that. and uh, that was fine. It was torture, but I mean we can live without each other if if people want to know that. Mm. But uh, we don't want to, you know. It's just too good. And because we are mind people, I thought it was because I was an only child, although I had stepsisters, I lived alone. Mm. That I, could, I always tripped on, out on my own, or in books or something like that, you know? Mm. And, uh, but she had sisters and brothers, but she was a different age group from then, so she was pretty lonely. I guess it's that, you know? Mm. We're both conceptual people in a way. Mm. And it's that, so we don't have to be apart to get away from each other. And we really like being together all the time, you know. Yes, and we and what about Sonny and Cher and Liz right. and Richard? I don't think they're ever We apart, identify you know. with everybody like that. But you see, and Byron and uh, McMahon, whoever or it whatever, was. whatever, right. But everybody you know, who's together and uh, Fitzgerald and Ronnie and all those Yeah. People. And what happened was I went to this women's uh, meeting or whatever. And I suddenly realized that all these people, you see, uh, in a women's meeting, they said, come alone, you know, this female lib thing. So I said, well, no, I don't go anywhere alone. I have, you know, I have to come with John, you know, I'd like to do that, you know. And then finally they said, all right, do come with John. So we went together. And later, uh, somebody criticized me for being arrogant, you know. For to, taking me along. Right. You know, to even ask, you know, that I sh I'd like to do that. And to do that was, you know, such a nerve, etc. But the, the point is, I said, well, you didn't have to really let us come. We didn't force in the door or anything, you know. They said all right in the end, but but you know I I don't see the arrogance about it. In other words, I can see that they can never forgive me and they can never, uh, you know, make me part of them because I'm married to John and being married established a certain you know sort of immediately they would criticize for the fact that we got married or the fact that we are together you know because that means that I'm not independent or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. But I think, you know, every person can have, you know, his or her own bag, you know, 
We don't have to all be alike. We can't be. And many people try to identify themselves with some group, certain group, because simply because if you are identifying yourself with a group, it's easier, you know, you're not alone, etc. Um, many times we were sort of tempted to join a certain group, you know, just Cleek so that and or Cleek or whatever. And we confess that we went through all that trip, but finally we found out there's nothing you can do about it. We just have to realize our own bags, you know, and that's all. And so um, I wish, you know, they would understand that, you know, that this is just good for us, you know. We're not saying, well, everybody should be this way or anything, but, you know, let us be a as we are, you know. It's, you know, to make a fantastic sort of, um, some kind of uh, theory out of us is ridiculous, you know. And to say, well, this is a, a sign of uh, dependence or, you know, whatever. Both of us are very strong people and also very vulnerable, but sort of unusually strong people, by now you must have realized... The laugh is that nobody ever know. said... Uh, they, they did say to us Beatles, as Beatles, uh, don't you get in each other's nerves? I suppose that was the mm. same question, but they didn't re... Now they're howling because we parted, but mm. uh, at the, there were times when I spent as much time with George, Paul and Ringo as I did with Yoko. I mean, I slept with them in the same room, in twin beds, of course, mm. Mm. on tour. And I lived, at and breathed with them for five or ten years or they something. They didn't mind that. Nobody said that about four young fags living together, <laughs> right? That was all right. Not a word. Know, that but was acceptable. To a man and a woman, oh yeah. my goodness, what's going on there with each other all the time? Mm. That's, there must be something perverse about it. No, it's not fashionable it anymore, I suppose, you know, <laughs> but it's all right with us because it works, you know. And uh, we're both very particular people. I don't think we can stand for a moment anything that we can't stand, you know? And we wouldn't even think of enduring something that we can't stand. So if we are doing this for four years, is it? Or something, I don't know, you know, we've been together for a long time. It seems like it's agreeable to us, you know? Well, it's obviously, is, by the way, we are, like you said, the change in us. You know, it's getting better, isn't it? Right, it's getting better, even, right? It's true. <laughs> Do you ever have major arguments? Oh, sure. Yes, we, I we mean, have lots of arguments, but We have so more what, artistic you know? arguments than anything else. Right, so. yeah. You know, a collaboration isn't easy. Right, right. No. And, you it's know, easy, we don't, but it isn't easy. Yeah, yeah, right. We don't compromise, you know, like neither of us are types that would say, oh, okay, oh, all right, you know. So we start It's really so, thrashed out. Right, but it's fine, you know, because, I mean, it you know. It keeps your mind alive, you mm. know. It's no good having being with people you can dominate all the time or being with somebody who can dominate you all the time because either one is boring. But if you're with somebody who's got a tick in mind, which was the best part of being with the Beatles when they were ticking, was they were ticking, you know. But uh, they began to slow down. We certainly but, don't uh, uh, bore With Yoko, you. it's like living with four or five people. <laughs> well, and we do say that, I mean, too. you know, it, it's, yeah. we'd be confirming George Martin. It is like we are schizophrenic, you know, like, right, so like schizophrenic. there's two of us. I often say to her, are you both in love with me? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it nice? You know, it's, it's far out. But, uh, we say, well, four of us are getting along very well these days, aren't we? You know, <laughs> something like that. That'll do. Uh, too. Mm. You know, I'll have us put away. <laughs> Uh, there was this uh, letter in the Village Voice a couple of weeks ago, which I really wish I could read over the air, but I can't Mr. because of the FCC oh, um, oh, mine, and all that. Yeah. Mine or his. And it seemed to have gotten a lot of people mad because all the answers yeah. were pretty weird. That was I know. I know. Just most of the what funniest. precipitated such a response yeah. from you? Well, uh, I don't believe anymore in just sitting back and having any arbitrary Tom, Dick, or Harry, whoever they are, famous or otherwise, just commenting about us. Uh, without commenting back, you know, uh, and for quite a time, if anybody, if I see anything that's written about me that I, I don't like or I don't agree with, there's, there are things that if people say, well, I don't like your record, that's too bad, you know, or I don't like your film, that's too bad. But when some maniac, maniac like that Carlson writes in saying, uh, who's never seen anything we've ever done or read anything we've ever said, probably, he might have heard a few Beatle records, start saying our films would only be shown because we're John and Yoko and Amos Vogel was demeaning himself by hanging around with us or being a sort of groupie uh, and uh, Amos Vogel and Yoko are friends from 10 or 15 years ago when she was in New York mm -hmm. and he's a new friend to me but 
she'd known him for years so it was just a very nasty thing to say and I'm not going to take that sort of crap from and it would be some English liberal fart living in <laughs> down there wherever he was living so I just swore at him and people I, I, wrote, I noticed most of the liberal letters that came back you know they're <laughs> obviously from liberals or Zionists Middle or whatever class. they were mm. and they all uh, attacking me for the language I used. Mm. You know, what are they? Are they Victorians or something? Mm. That's the way I speak. If they want to go down into the ghetto or get off out of their offices and onto the street, they'll hear that's how people talk. Mm. Well, I write like a talk, you know. And I, think it was I thought marvelous. it was very, vocabulary, you know. very sort of, just sort of fruity middle class, mm. you know, to start com that most of the letters were complaining about the language. That was the real joke. I thought the funniest, the only sort of reasonable letter that came back was the one that had any humor I thought was the one that's the short one that said it's nice to see how well John and Yoko <laughs> take criticism I thought that was good you know that was funny you know <laughs> because it was insane because the guy wrote the first letter and I write this sort of you know abusive any any swear word that came into my head immediately I read it and then this guy writes to say how charming we were with with his tongue in his cheek. I thought that was alright, but the rest I thought was just rubbish. Now that's why I sent another one just saying gobble doodle doodle goggle goodle. Because when you read through all their letters about me, it was just that, you know, gobble goobble goobble. It didn't say anything. Mm. And well, the lunatic was saying if you took the swear words out, it wouldn't say anything. Well, mm. let me tell that lunatic swear words are words. And, and they say emotions. something. Yes. They say something. They express you know. strong emotions. They're not. You know? They don't not exist because they're not in your little Oxford din dictionary, mm. Mister. They're words. They're the words I use to describe things. Mm. They are words. They so you can't uh, complain about my letter. How about taking every S and E out of your letter and see mm. how that looks? <laughs> that's beautiful. Mm. Mm. So that's that one. <laughs> I thought. And in know. England, I, I was telling you before you asked me about it. Uh, they often write especially in the really crummy pop papers, you know, they write really garbled stuff about us. And I just take the time to write to them and tell them what it really is, you know. If they get, uh, right, George, George Martin's been doing a three-part serial in the Melody Maker. While most of it's fairly fair and reasonable, and uh, although it sometimes differs from my memory of what happened, some of it is just downright lies. So I just wrote in and corrected him, you know. He's making statements about how revolution number nine was made and he's saying how he pictured this sound picture and I wrote to him and the paper saying that uh, I'm sick of the d cameraman taking credit for the, what the director did you know and that's what he's doing I made revolution number nine four hours of editing was done with Yoko and I alone in a room after everybody else had left the thing mm -hmm. alone and he's claiming he, he that was his picture you know mm -hmm. uh, George and Ringo and George Martin and one other engineer fetched and carried and helped me put together about a hundred loops and uh, George and Ringo running up and downstairs getting different soundtracks for me and suggesting things obviously if they were there but mainly helping me physically George Martin was sort of helping me by naming uh, what stuff I could use from the vaults and helping me technically, of course, and the engineer to help me technically. And he's writing all sorts of guff there. So I consider it unfair if they're just gonna have one side of the story. I don't mind if I say something that offends people or they think I'm, I've got the wrong picture of it, you know? That for them to write back to me, against me and say, well, I, I, that's not true, this and this happened as far as I'm concerned, that's all right. But I'm not just gonna sit back and let them write any old shit about us, you know? Mm. And not only that, but <coughs> we believe in communication, you know? And, I mean, I thought that letter that John wrote was extremely communicative, and, I, I, you know, it's very good to communicate. And uh, many people are afraid <coughs> of, you know, saying anything. They say, well, it's unwise to say it. I know you feel that way, but just don't say it. You know, it's better. No, you know, I felt, exactly. I liked it. Oh, yeah. So yeah. Like, you know, I thought, that's what I thought. I thought, oh, why should everybody, anybody in the public eye is supposed to yeah, refrain no. from... Mm. Well, all of course, I've had a few scenes like that on my radio show where you know people call up and say, "Play the Grateful Dead." I yeah. happen to not like the Grateful Dead, and they were annoying me so much, yeah. so I just made jokes about it and all. Yeah. People call, "How dare you say that? You yeah. have a right not to like them, but why should you say anything?" You know, you say what you like. Who says I know. you can't say anything you like? And what are they doing? And that guy writing about freedom of the press. Some mm -hmm. one of them calling himself the an old-time foreigner or some jazz like that. Talking about freedom of the press, you know.
And it was very poetic, I thought, you know, because it was such an extreme expression, you know. And they didn't get the humor of it. But the point is, um, I always thought that American culture, if it offered anything at all in the past 50 years, was sense of humor, you know, to the world, you know. It was a yeah, great sense of humor. I mean, Walt Disney, the whole thing, you know, about Hollywood and all that is Well, from Walt so Disney funny. to Andy, almost. Well, anything, you know. right. And Andy Warhol is a great, you know, sort of representative of all that, you know, culture. But I mean, all that humor, I thought Americans are the ones who would <coughs> understand it, you know, because they made it. And somehow, I think America is getting less humorous, you know what I mean? Humorless, you know. Don't you find it so? Yeah. I mean, they're but, getting more and Well, more it was tense. like that. The Americans never dug the goon show in England until 15, 15 years. It. No, they heard it. It was offered mm -hmm. to American yeah. radio and they wouldn't take it. And it was some of the best radio that's ever been done in the world. Now it's a bit popular with a few people, I believe. The big it? complaint on the song against yeah. Paul on your album, though, when ah, I played it that yeah. night, yeah. was that you had no sense of humor. Well, oh, that was a lot of people that. called. So what happened to his sense Don't of you think what's his sense of levity? I think one Where of the funniest lines on that song. Uh, I'm sure Paul will understand it, and uh, George it. does, and so do mm -hmm. I. That that song is another thing like that letter. It's just a moment of anger, but I just put it down on paper. I'm also answering uh, Paul's last album, which mostly be because he didn't hand out a lyric sheet. Don't know what he was saying. Uh, it starts off with too many mistake. people going underground. That was your first mistake. And the first mistake bit is referring to us and all the others. Uh, about you, isn't it? Yeah, uh, about uh, you, you took your lucky break and broke it in two. Mm. Now, if that mm. doesn't mean what it says, I don't know what. Also, the song ends, we, we believe that we can't be wrong. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a, a re reciprocal song. And I think that some of the funniest lines on the album are uh, the biggest thing, whatever it had done was yesterday. And it was actually Klein's line, one line of it. Uh, and since you've gone, you're just another day. I think it's the funniest thing I've ever heard. I don't think that about Paul all my life or all the time. I was... Uh, I wrote it in an immediate response to when I heard his messages coming off his album, you know. Did you think it was you funny? You mightn't hear him, but I can hear him, and no, I know Paul. That song I didn't think was funny, but from knowing you now, yeah. I know that that's not how you feel all the time. It's, a, it's, yeah. it's an angry song. Uh, like not the serious <laughs> angry. It's not serious. Like, like Paul is really, really hurt by it. I'll, soon, I'll know by the vibes come round, mm -hmm. even if he doesn't call. Well, I'll explain it to him. I'll even write to him, you know, if he it's really, like really thinks it's... kidding a little, you know thinks it's really now, really come serious on, you, you know, know that kind of thing but uh, i i think it's quite funny and i was laughing when we were making it and mm. listening to it hmm. but uh, i was laughing at his later but at first i was like oh hmm, oh i see oh that's what he thinks you know puffing and puffing that's mm. the first thing i heard on his album was all this, and also this I think message you see john and paul are very close to each other and uh, when they're doing the session and all that they used to always sort of kid each other with pretty you know, sort of words that may sound harsh to other people, objectively, you know what I mean? So, I think it would have sounded very different to Paul, you know? I we mean, never tittled each other gently. You know? I didn't know that. Hmm. Like slapping your back bit, you know, that kind of humor, I think. Hmm. Uh, I printed my column on The Voice that you and uh, George were going to go on tour and everything like that, and everybody called me. Yeah. during the week and said they had called Apple f yeah. for confirmation and Apple had said absolutely untrue Smith lied in his column well uh, uh, you and I know I'm not where I got the, you probably you know, got it from Alan well you see after the Bangladesh concert I'll tell you how it all how you got into that predicament uh, is that after the Bangladesh concert I heard from Alan that it was very good and and everybody you know and uh, George came up with this good idea of going out on tour, say us as well, there's a lot of people and like playing different places, say maybe one night free, maybe one night not, you know, and that was what we were all talking about at that time. But uh, none of us made up our mind, you see. And I was thinking, I don't really want to go out on a big package tour, uh, especially maybe with the others, because the thing that spoiled the Bangladesh thing for me was it was all about the Beatles on tour, you know as if the Beatles were playing. And if I go out, I think I'll just go out with uh, people that aren't the Beatles, you know, like other people. 
So uh, there was a moment when where we all think that wasn't that's a good idea, but nothing was ever settled. Oh, because I thought it was a great idea. It mm -hmm. might be, but I don't know. You know, we'll see. Because the Bangladesh concert was fantastic, you know, in terms of production, in terms yeah, of sound, it showed that it could be done without yeah. a tremendous tumult. But I would like to take something on the road that wasn't just the same old rock show, you know. I'd like to do something with Yoko so why don't that involved the audience. Wouldn't you get a well, charge we, out of that? We are going to, actually, yeah. but I don't want it all they're going out on the road all <laughs> over the world kind of thing. Uh, we After we finish the museum show, we'll probably take Jim and Klaus and maybe a couple more people rehearse and then decide to go on the road or something. I don't know how, in what form, but we don't want to just go on and play. We want something that involves audience too. Mm. So we really want to make it more theatrical. Yeah, something still really rock -like. positive, you know. Still rock and roll, but something. Yeah, because knowing both of you, I think it would be a tremendous hassle. But I think you'd have such a charge oh, out of it from watching you time, both you know? do things like make mm. movies and and yeah. that night on the radio show, just that little radio happening. But to do all that in front of a live yeah. audience, I mean, well, you really that's get on the cards, on you know. That's on the mm. cards. But as for going out with George and Ringo and Dylan and it Leon Russell and all the, the stars, I don't fancy that. Mm. I fancy going out with. Uh, a few good bands, maybe not well-known bands, you know, yeah. uh, and a few sort of people that would, could uh, do grapefruit happening in the audience <coughs> and take a few sort of far-out friends of ours to perform in the auditorium, say, and, and really have a, a whole thing going right through the audience, you know, and, and on the way in and on the way out and all over the place instead of just on the stage. Mm -hmm. But we would still go on and rock you know but uh, there'll be lots of other things going on something uh, with a bit more to it you know because mm. the more we think about it you see the more we like it yeah <laughs> because I, especially after yeah. bangladesh though i'm sorry to watch it you no, say that no. no what i was thinking was that i really started to believe that total communication equals peace you know somebody was asking me a question uh from japan or something actually he said uh what is your concert of utopia and I suddenly thought of it and then it just occurred to me that my concept of utopia is when everybody has their freedom you know like total freedom a world of total freedom and then they were saying well would not be dangerous that's the first thing they think about you know is it dangerous you know <laughs> you can't uh, let them be free you know that's that's too dangerous but the point is uh, if everybody becomes totally free then, you know, in the, initially there would be some kind of hassle, I think, but um, eventually it would sort of balance out and people would do whatever is good for them. They wouldn't harm each other or harm oneself, you know, they, they wouldn't do that. So um, it would be beautiful and that's my concept of utopia. And then that world, that kind of world could only come when everybody would uh, sort of um, get out of that violent feeling that we all have, you know? And violence is just uh, a feeling, an emotion that comes out only when you can't communicate properly, you know? You know that thing about a little boy coming to uh, his mommy and saying, well, mommy, mommy, and, and mother doesn't answer. And then he starts to feel violent, starts to hit her, you know, that feeling. So uh, I think if there's total communication in the world, which is possible, you know, it's not just not a sort of crazy optimism but then I really think there would be peace and that's the only time that we would actually have peace in this world and uh, so if we're working on it that's why we feel that you know whatever we're doing through you know doing through art is really directly connected with that you know because art is communication so the more we think about it we want to sort of communicate more positively you know like go on a road, <laughs> that's one thing, right? Yeah, it's like the ad on TV, there's an ad sort of for art, it says like take away man's this, that, you know, his paintings, his pictures, his books, his radio, his music. And uh, there's this sort of myth in society, and possibly on the extreme <coughs> left and right wing, that art is something that is extra, mm. you know, like chocolate. That you don't need. You know, that you, you don't know. need, that you only need rice and meat. You know, but art is something, and artists are something that are necessary to any society, and they're just as important as soldiers or politicians. 
mm. and there is that dream of you know art is an extra thing like a bowl of flowers and it isn't it's an integral part of everyday life you know and uh, that's what we would like to break mm. What other plans? What other kinds of things are cooking? Oh, that, that's all. That's new, all that was a cooking. A new movie or anything? Well, this movie we're making, which is will be seventy or ninety minutes, the T for TV. But there'll also be a movie version, which we'll try and get out as a film too. And then, of course, we have other ideas for mo different movies and things. But uh, after the after the museum show, the next plan is to get the group together and then uh, think what we're going to do with it and then mm -hmm. maybe make a few movies as well. Mm. And also the off-Broadway show. Oh yeah, Yoko. Yes. I forgot about that. <laughs> right. She's having an off-Broadway show. <laughs> when? Uh, after, right after this museum after show. The, well, after oh. the museum show oh. and the off-Broadway show, then we get the band oh. together. <laughs> or I'll get it together in the well, front I'm half of the theatre right. while you're directing <laughs> in the back half. What, a play that you've written? Uh, we did it actually a long time ago called Over Grapefruit in the World of Park. And that was I didn't. performed she, she in uh, did that, you know, Village ago. Gate. The Village Gate, you know. I don't really, yeah, but I don't yeah. remember that. In a dark night, Monday you night probably or something. Blinked. Uh, no, I don't think you were around then. I don't you know, probably remember. Before your time, how old? <laughs> I'm pretty old, you know. And then, what was it? Uh, the other one. Oh, yeah, well, anyway, it was performed in several places in New York before, you know, like 1960 early 1960s, 61 or 60 or something. But uh, this time it's going to be done, you know, in a different way, but it will be done. It was more like a music piece then, but then it's, you know, it was half theatre, half music, you know, but then... 1960, I was playing the Locarno theater, Blackpool and all From that Brighton. jazz <laughs> ballrooms we were doing there. That's, yeah, that's mm -hmm. around the time. <laughs> I was just a little yeah. child in 1960. No. Oh, how, old yeah. how old are you? How old are you? Come, Come on, on now. How old am I? Let me see. 19, 19 next week. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. What is the, uh, the t-shirt? You are here. Oh, uh... Well, funny you should ask that, uh, Howard. I was just going to mention it. <laughs> well, uh, when I first met Yoko, uh, she encouraged me to make films, make more far-out music. Uh, Gallery exhibitions. Make more of the art I was doing. Anything privately, was Anything doing, I was yeah. doing, she encouraged me to do it. So just after we met, I put on a gallery show at Robert Fraser Gallery in London, which is about one of the only sort of swinging kind of places London had. And I put a show that on gallery, there. That gallery, by the way, oh. yeah, extinct now. Yeah, that's gone too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but that was going a long, long, many years before it went. Robert just got fed up and went to India on that trip. You know. <laughs> anyway, so I had a show there called You Are Here. And what it consisted of was a bare gallery and a big, big white canvas that was round. And it just had my writing in the middle, You Are Here. And you went on to the top floor of the gallery and it was down in the stairs. You had to go down the stairs and down at the bottom of the stairs were thousands of different charity cans like RSPCA, you know, animal things and cancer funds and dogs and people. And you had to get through all these different charity cans. The room was full of them, you know. It was like the water event today, only without any water. Mm -hmm. The room was full of this, <laughs> these different cans, you know, to mm -hmm. put money in. People put money in. Then you got to the other end of the room mm -hmm. and on the left side of the wall was this big, big canvas with you are here. And that was it, you see. Because, I mean, a lot of people went to India to find out they were here. You know, like uh, Leary's <coughs> friend, uh, Albert or whatever, is the, Peter here, a friend Albert of ours, got a book of his. And George was telling me about it the other day, and like this Albert went to India and he oh, saw oh, all the gurus. And, the Baba Ram. Yeah, chasing all over the place. And then he finally met his guru. All the guru said to him, remember now, be here. Remember now, be here. Well, I got it off, off Yoko. <laughs> so I, you are here is what the message is, you know. And so I had this show, and it was quite well received, and we did a candid camera kind of film of it, of people's reactions, because as you got to the, the canvas itself, there was just a hat to put money in for the artist. <laughs> and, and they all reacted to yeah, that, you know. And a little bowl of badges, that, a little teeny white badges that said, you are here, very tiny, that they got, they put some money in the hat and they got a badge, you see. And we were filming them from behind a dark window with the English candid camera team. And it's just a documentary, you know, it'll be around, but it's not, that's interesting, but not much. And also, we let balloons off with send your message back when you get it, you see. So it would land in somewhere in a field, you know, 50 miles away, and people would write back to me. 
They would say, you are here when they found it, and then they'd say, write to me, and they'd write to tell me where it came from. Yeah. And that's what it was. And then I, we stuck a book together about it, but I couldn't get it published, and so Magic. it was just lying on the floor. Mm. So that's Nobody what you are here is. that you know? So it's that's amazing. what you are here. So I'll, I'll just, I cut the canvas down, because they made it too big, and it's about, you know, three foot now. And I'll, I'll stick that in the corner somewhere in her gallery show. Mm. Most guest artist. And a few other things I've got. Yeah, but the more and more I think about it, you see, the only way we can go is either total destruction and everybody's going to be just so hysterical and just violent and the whole world is going to just smash into pieces. Or because the world is getting smaller and smaller, you know? You notice that, you know? So uh, if it's smaller and smaller, then we would suffocate each other, either suffocate each other or become completely agreeable with each other, agreeable with each other, and become like a one big family, you know? So the way to solve it is by communication. I bring it up again. But, you know, there's some people who don't even realize that they have the need of communication, you know, and they don't know why they're un unhappy. And they say, well, communication, I don't need to communicate with anybody, you know, that kind of thing. But still, they're un unhappy, they don't know what it is, and they're just violent. But if we sort of admit our need for communication and start to communicate, you know, the fact that somebody understood you means that somebody sort of, you know, accepted you, appreciated you with love, you know? And there's nobody in this world who doesn't need love. So, you know, communication is just a way of giving love, you see? So we just have to do that. And the more we communicate, we're going to be more peaceful, you know? Because this this big lump in us, you know, that's sort of like dying to come out, and it's going to either come out violently or smoothly as communication. And then some people say, well, look, it's all right, all you artists, you know, say that you can communicate and all that, but you you have a talent for communication, you know. But us here, we don't. We're just born to be an audience, you know. And I object very strongly to that kind of thinking because I think. You know, somebody taught them that they're not artists, you know. But everybody can be an artist. the simplest thing in the world. Artist means just somebody who knows how to communicate. And because of the necessity of communication, that necessity itself gives them the imagination, you know. Imagination is only sort of some a product of necessity. And they bring out the imagination, and that imagination with that imagination, they, you know, find some ways of communication, that's all. Mm -hmm. So, you know, artists are not born imaginative or anything, everybody's imaginative. If they admit their, ne you know, necessity to communicate, they're going to suddenly become very imaginative, you know? It's the end of the tape. But she almost yeah, I said know, it I the know, same know. before, but yeah. that was better, you know. Yeah. But there's some, sometimes people say repetition is the only way to communicate, so. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Well, what are we on a new one? Okay. Well, yeah. should we do it? Let's sum it roll up. Roll it up. Shall or yeah. Wrap okay. it up I, I want to ask you just one or two things that okay. I had written down that I don't right. think I touched on. Uh, are you moving to the United States? No, that's another myth. <laughs> uh, I mean, I have people calling me sometimes with the yeah. voice saying, "Could you give me John and Yoko's uh, address at their loft in New York?" There's no. a whole thing that you're living in a loft in oh, Soho. Oh, that? No, no, no. Not true. It's not true. We're we're living in a hotel, <laughs> and then. We have a house in England. Yes, and that is uh, our home, Ascot. Sometimes we would borrow somebody's loft for different things. You know? But there are no plans to move here at this no, point? No, no, definitely not. But that no. doesn't mean that we don't like this place. We love this place. I but, love the village. Uh, I think yes. it came out of that. Yeah, I really mm. enjoy it. And I love all those lofts and all the people wandering around. And it's just beautiful, you know. Mm. So we'll so come I, here very often, I'm people, sure. I was talking know. about that, and I, I might have said I'd love to live here, you know. but. Uh, I don't intend living here, because mm. I've just finished setting up home in England. Mm. And we have a very nice home there. That's another thing, you see, because uh, when we moved into Ascot, probably was sort of, you know, it didn't fit us quite well, and we had to do this and that to change it around, and now it's gradually becoming really our home, you know. That's why maybe we feel better too. That's yeah, another thing. do this then. Okay. Mm. Mm. What happened to the tapes with uh, Zappa? at the uh, uh, film or well, all of that, because originally I thought you were going to use it on your album, Yoko. Well, oh. we were, but there was so much, you mm, see, so, so we many. think maybe that, that can have to be another album, you know. 
Yes, and also we weren't sure where I thought maybe Zappa is going to use it, and then I, I saw that he didn't. But uh, so now that I know that he didn't, so well, he next said he didn't I'll because of some scene or other, you know. But we didn't know, you see. We so nobody know, knew anything about it. So it'll come out one way or the other. But yes. there's no hurry. Right, I think it, it will come out eventually because it has to. It's pretty good stuff, you know. Mm. Just haven't had time to remix it. That's mm. all. Yeah. The Beatlemania thing, you know, the ability to just walk down the street or go to a restaurant, has that improved at all? Can oh, you do great, that yeah. now? Yeah, we're always doing it. You know, mm. I just often eat out and in the village a lot. And people are very good, you know. Mm. We're very happy on a New York street, aren't we? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah we don't get bothered mm. at all. They're either drunk or high, you know, really stoned if they, they'll bother you. Oh, I mean, some people ask for autograph now and then, but not many, not enough to bug you, you know. And if I really don't feel like it, I'll just say, well, do you mind waiting until I've eaten? And, you know, because sometimes I'll ask you <laughs> while you're trying to shove the food in your mouth. No, I remember but, that time we walked around in the village, it was definitely the people who were drunk that just yeah, wouldn't right. leave. Remember yeah, that? but the, the others were all right, weren't they? You know? blocks. Yeah, they the rest were, of the people, if you just said, look, and we have privacy, yeah, they'd yeah. walk away. Right, right. Mm. And that was a pretty crowded day, too, and we, we hadn't been around for a bit, but now they're getting used to us being around now, you know. We've come and we've been and gone a few times this year. And when we first walked around with you, we hadn't been for maybe a year or more, and there was you and us two all wandering around the village, so like tourists, and we stood out a bit anyway, didn't we? Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but now I think we're sort of more or less, uh, you know, part of the scene, aren't we? Or I guess so. Art is just a frame of mind. Mm. You throw in those things. Mm. Peace, brother. Get it on, rip them off. Mm. One point you had mentioned to me that you thought maybe of going to China. I'd love to go, you know. If it had I'd ever opened up, and now it seems to have yeah. very opened up. But of course for British subjects it's been open for years, right? Really? No, they weren't talking to the British for a bit. I don't know. It was a bit funny a few years back. I'd love to go. I just hope they don't take uh, you know, a revolution song about a bit about Chairman Mao seriously. Or you know? <laughs> well, they wouldn't let me in. But I'd really love to go, especially after I heard the reports from the ping pong people, you know. You know, because I guess that, well, they were neither, I guess they were hand-picked by the government and they came back sort of saying very nice things about China and Chinese people and everything. Very nice. I mean, and uh, sound like they sounded like Maoists. Yeah, fantastic. but I mean, they must have been hand-picked by the government. They wouldn't have sent any lefties <laughs> over, would they? Mm. So it must be pretty nice to sort of have impressed those people, the ping-pong players so much. I especially would like to go. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's very nice. I would love to do that. But I don't know how, we have to get permission or I don't know how to go about it really, you know. So it's very hard. But we probably would eventually go back. I'd like to go to Russia too. We've been too doing everything down. that we want to do up to now. But I'd like to go and play rock and roll in Russia. Oh yes, that'd be great. And in China yeah. if they'd let us, but Russia, I think you could do it there probably. Mm. You know, because the kids, they, they, they have all the records, you know, they get all the tapes. Like if you read Jonas's report, you know, like Dylan was coming out the windows and all that kind of thing. <laughs> Well, they know everything. They get it all on these big radios, you know. They're not sort of in the sticks. We always imagine them sort of just about listening to Bill Haley, you know. But they're well up with the music, so it might mm. be good for some of us to go over there and show them, you know. That's another way of making the world sort of world smaller, you know. You're so right. Yes. You're so right, my dear. Artist is just a frame of mind. We and anybody <laughs> can be an artist. <laughs> when is a door not a door? When is a jaw? Ha <laughs> ha, <laughs> don't we should know that. How did people react? It's a you know long time ago thing, but how did people react to that thing that we did on your radio? You know, it was pretty mixed. But crazy in general, one. I think people liked it. That just kind of happening thing. Yeah. Mm. Some people, you know, that we met said, "I was just going in the car and I turned the radio on. This crazy thing came out. They didn't know what the hell it was, and then they listened and listened, you know, and they're thinking, what is it? What is it? And then it turned out to be us.' Oh, and there was a kid that came up to us uh, when we were, you know, down in the village and said, well, listen, now I know what you mean. It just means that we have to do our own thing. Yeah, so right. He great. just came, young, it must have been about 19 or 20, he just came running over and she said that to us and ran off. was the message. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. beautiful. It was beautiful. And of course, uh, with your help and all the, we shipped it all over the place. I don't know what reactions were to other, from other people. I, I have either. never heard any, whether anybody played it or not. But no, we it was did. played around the country. Yeah, it was good. So we sent the tape all over, which is good, you know. So that was nice. I loved it. 
Yeah, I had a good time. Oh, it was really <laughs> good, wasn't it? It was really freaky. I love the records too, you know, all the ones, we, all those the old part rock that, I, that I always tell people about who haven't heard it was the thing with, can you say that a little lower? I think <laughs> I kept doing it. it yeah, was I've never listened to it since we had it. I, I, if I get a break, I'll listen yeah. to it. And also, I just remembered our films are going to go out in, uh, you know, the college circuit. I think it's going to be shown around for the oh. first time. But, you know, I don't know when they can see this film that, we're now sort of on TV, right? But I mean, I don't know when that's going to be. But you know, I'll be within the next month. Maybe you see, it's, it's got to so be. It's about these albums. I wish you current. could see it because you know what it happens in this film. It's the most recent film, but we're constantly finding ourselves whenever, wherever we go. And we'll know? open the door, and we'll already be in there. Yes. Like there's a and scene where hi to John and Yoko. John and Yoko says hi to John and Yoko. And you look down yeah. his telescope and we're already, everywhere we go, we, every door we open, we're already there. Mm. It's amazing. It just mm. happened like that. We just shot a lot, shot a lot of footage, mm. you know, and uh, just sort like of stuck it together. Life, yeah. it? It's beautiful. And then there's a point where I'm talking to John like this and suddenly John is not there, I'm still talking and then he's suddenly there again, you know, that kind of thing. Mm. We're having great fun with it, you know. It's just like recording, really, only with it pictures, is, isn't it? Yes, yes mm. it is a bit, yes. Mm. Mm. Okay, thank you. A pleasure again. Right. And uh, is that have you done them all? Yeah. Thanks, so, yes. Do you want to mention this one more time? Yeah. <laughs> no, <they're> all right. <laughs> so. Have we, have we well, not mentioned it? Yoga's, about Yoga's <laughs> wonderful new it. album with ballads, rock, and avant-garde Holocausts on it. Double album coming out. Sure, it's really good. Hello, Ozzy. Hello, Rick. Are you going to play? Yeah, we're going to play. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good night, Howard, and God bless you.